Eh, it's being streamed to the internet. Now I need to go, now I need to add the, screw it, we're going to do it live. I'll, I'll let him close the door so I don't disturb everyone in the hallway. Never. Except today. Hello, everybody. Did you have a good lunch? Yes? Yeah. Okay. Is everybody having a good time so far? All right, that's good. How many people in this room were actually at the first DerbyCon? Oh, wow. Most of you. Good. So that's why you're here. You haven't seen me speak before. Um, <laughs> so uh, my name is uh, Joey Maresca. Some people may know me by, as Lost Knowledge. Uh, this is the APT cyber cloud of the Internet of Things, or how buzzwords have helped kill an industry. Uh, so just a little bit of background on me. Uh, that is my normal Twitter profile picture. I have actually changed it right now so people can recognize me when I'm in public. As I mentioned the other day, they don't let me wear that out in public anymore. Um, I like Legos. I like Star Wars. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a dork. What can I say? Um, I run an event here um, since the first uh, DerbyCon um, called BourbonCon. Uh, I like bourbon. Um, I just moved out of the D.C. metro area, but I still think, you know, I still find kindred spirits with the Nova Hackers and all the great people I've met there. Um, and I put my employer on here because, for once, I actually am not ashamed of my employer. Um, and I'm not just saying that because my boss walked in the room. So I'm going to do a quick shameless plugging for BourbonCon. Um, it is tonight. Um, it is mentioned in the events in your program. Uh, if you want to come, we are scheduled from 9 to midnight. It is at the Galt House, right up 4th Street. Go out the front of the hotel, make a right, and just walk until you get to the river. If you wind up in the river, you've gone too far. Um, we do bourbon tasting every year. Um, it is 20 bucks cash at the door. Um, if for some reason you don't carry cash with you, um, there are ATMs that will distribute them. Um, or until 8 p.m. tonight, uh, we do still have some pre-sale tickets available on Eventbrite. Um, look at the at BourbonCon Twitter profile. The link is on there. Um, we have great sponsors this year, like we do every year. Um, you know, uh, besides Cincinnati, has been great the last two years to sponsor us, and so we've been able to give away glassware. We do have a limited number, so pre-sales people get priority. <laughs> um, and then, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a quiet atmosphere. It's social. You come. You don't have to stay the whole three hours. You can come, taste your bourbons, and leave in 15 minutes if you wanted to. So um, all the money that we uh, raised from that event um, beyond, uh, beyond our costs go to HFC. Last year we raised over $2,000 uh, for them. Uh, so we're hoping we can um, hopefully get to that this year. It's not looking too good right now, so I need a lot of people to show up tonight. <laughs> now I'll get to my disclaimers. Um, I had to do this one a few years ago, which is that all views and opinions contained within this presentation are my own. They do not reflect the beliefs or opinions of my employer or any other affiliated organizations. Uh, my new employer hasn't asked for that, but I'm just preempting them. Uh, disclaimer number two is specific for this talk. If you play buzzword drinking games, this talk may be dangerous to your health. Uh, there will be several such words used throughout the presentation. However, their usage is intended for academic use only and is not recommended that you use these words in your normal daily life. As such, I actually did have a couple of other um, talk titles I was originally going to use, uh, like drinking games are fun, um, how to anger uh, organizers and sponsors, um, because there may be some subtle and some also not so subtle um, jabbings at certain uh, uh, companies during this presentation. Um, I won't name names, I promise. Um, and then when talk titles, when talks become B movie titles, because it seems like every time I do a talk presentation, I intentionally give it a title that always has a subtitle to it for some reason. Uh, so one more little background piece. Uh, in some of my research, I did uh, a lot of wanting to validate where some of these buzzwords came from, um, how long they've been around, what we've been doing with them. Um, I found two really good sources for this are looking at patents. Because um, by the time it starts appearing in patents, it's already probably been used for the last like four or five years. Um, the other one is Wikipedia because, good God, everything's there. But as it says there, trust but verify. Uh, you know, I found with a lot of this, um, it's one of these little buggy things when you're doing... Uh, when you're looking up, you know, etymology of words and trying to find out its histories, it's it's very sketchy, and it's surprising we can do it at all, considering I'm looking at words that are largely from the last 50 years, and it's still impossible to figure out how the hell they came about. 
It's a buzzword. It's the word that defines itself. So this is the dictionary definition I found. Uh, you know, it's it's what we all think it is, right? It, it's it's really just code for jargon, but you know, at some point we thought it was more fun to call it a buzzword. Um, and like I said, with all these, the origins are somewhat murky. The one that gets repeated a lot on the internet is that you know, in the 1940s, business students at Harvard who had nothing better to do decided to start referring to certain words as buzzwords um, in their business classes. Uh, I've seen other sites without much reference that point to the 60s and 70s. It's it's one of those things where you can dig and dig and dig and trying to find out when somebody first used it. Um, I actually tried to use even some really old, uh, a couple sites that do like archived uh, newspapers and stuff like that to see if I could find like pre like pre 1900s references to the words, but I could not. Um, I think I saw one use of buzz and word, but it was not in the right context, and I wasn't even quite sure what they were using it for. Uh, here's my definition of a buzzword. Um, really, it's it's any phrase that's used by corporations, marketers, and salesmen that are intended to sound important, designed to confuse the users, and mask the real intent or veracity of a product or solution. All right, some companies will sit out there and scream, "We use a sandbox," and act like they're secure. Um, I won't name names. Um, so it's one of those things where you know, it is a buzzword a buzzword? Um, you know, I, I don't know what an Eagle Montoya would think, but there are moments I do believe it is. So I decided to start with everyone's favorite buzzword, cyber. And I'm going to be saying cyber a lot right now. So you can all cringe. But as Jules would say, say cyber one more time, motherfucker. I dare you. So what are its origins? Um, Basically, it, it all came out from cybernetics, and then at some point somebody decided to take the cyber off of it and start using it for a bunch of words. I found this one from New York Magazine, this quote very, very hilarious, which was, which is from 96, before I think cyber became ridiculous. And it was, cyber is a perfect prefix because nobody has any idea what it means. It can be grafted onto any old word to make it seem new, cool, and therefore strange and spooky. Um, and I think that's very true. I think a lot of the issues we deal with in computer security, information security, network security, whatever we want to call it, and as everybody likes to blanket it as cyber security, I think a lot of those same terms, we get to make it sound spookier. And particularly to the, a lot of the decision makers that work at these companies who don't know better, it just fuels that you know fear of anything new. So as I mentioned, some of the origins, you know, it dates back to cybernetics being used back in the 60s. Um, the Control Data Corporation started selling cyber mainframes. Uh, it was the brand of the machines they sold. Um, I found patents that reference different words for cyber dating back to the 70s. Um, you know, some, some people blame William Gibson for, you know, using cyberspace and then cybering everything. Um, but I think in honesty, at some point, some marketer decided, hey, this sounds really scary. Let's use cyber for everything. And as you can see, we'll put cyber on anything. Um, you know, it's, there's, there, there's, as I like to say, there are more forms of cyber than there are ways to cook a shrimp. Um, so it really is one of those situations where they come up with new words, you know, it, what's different about cybersecurity from all the other words that we're using, right? If, if I refer to network security or computer security or system security, they just try to re use cyber as this blanket term. Um, you know, it's it's this new abstract thing, and so they like to use this as a term to scare people. It really is what a lot of it is. Um, so the next one, APT, and isn't that like I said? Isn't that how I install packages in Debian? I was like, so the Chinese in my box. I, I'm sure everyone's made that joke. I'm sorry. Um, so it's advanced persistent threat. Pretty much every source you'll find dates this back to the U.S. Air Force circa about 2006. So thank you, it's an acronym. Yes, you can blame the U.S. government. That sounds about right. Um, I've seen patent filings dating back to about 2007, 2008. So again, that kind of matches up with the 2006 timeline. Um, but the reality is, you know, and, and this is partly my own belief from what I was seeing, is that until APT1 came out, nobody knew what the fuck APT was. And then some company, who I won't name, made a shit ton of money going APT, 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 and screaming. And so that company and several others 
have basically tried to tell us this is what APT looks like. This is the FBI wanted poster for the Chinese PLA who are responsible for hacking all our shit. Here's the reality, okay? Um, more times than not, you're going to have an advanced persistent threat that looks more like this. You know, it's, it, the, the reality is, I think, I think the, the internet in particular and, and our news corporations have done a really great job of convincing us that advanced persistent threat means that they're sophisticated. This is sophisticated. This is not. And that's the problem, is that we use the same term for both. And so companies, who I won't name, can sell products for lots of money and convince government agencies that they, you know, that their products are secure and that they'll protect them from these things. But the reality is, they might protect them from this, but they will not protect them from this. Um, I think we've seen that. Um, and some of those companies, same practices and their security of their own security products recently just made me smile. Um, it's a new marketing term. I, I went and Googled advanced persistent threat and I had half a page of ads um, from like everybody from, hey, look, that's FireEye right on top. Uh, and then Cisco and, you know, it's, and then companies start coming up that I don't know. I'm like, Jesus, will anybody sell me anything APT? And the answer is yes. So if APT, yes, there is. But if APT drives me nuts, there is one word that drives me bonkier and bonkier. And it's got nothing to do, it's very peripheral to, to security, and it's the cloud. Wow. Yes, the groan. So, like I said, it's renaming the internet, right? I mean, cloud computing. So, the reality is we've been referring to networks in some way, shape, or form as clouds going back in, to the ARPANET days. You go look at some of those hand-drawn pictures and, hey, here's this mysterious network. It looks like a cloud. We've been doing that for a long time. Um, the reality is the types of services they've been offering existed all the way back to the 70s, right? I mean, IBM and DEC made a lot of money doing time-sharing services and, you know, rent your time on a mainframe because you don't want to buy one. It sounds a hell of a lot like, I don't want to build a server farm. I'll rent time from Amazon. Like, nobody reinvented the wheel when cloud computing came out. They just took a 40-year-old idea and called it something new and different. Um, now, it's grown a lot since then because it's not just hosted computing time anymore, right? I mean, there's hosted infrastructure, there's hosted services, there's hosted applications. We can host everything now. But I think the important thing to remember is there is no cloud. It's just somebody else's computer. I, I still love that sticker. I need to get one for my computer. Um, because it, and the reality is you're relying on somebody else for security at that point. And so this is one of those things that drives me nuts. People say, oh, well, we're more secure because we're in the cloud. I was like, so you're trusting that Amazon or Google or Microsoft or whoever services you're paying for are far more secure than what you could host internally. And so I think that's just, it's one of those myths that's kind of grown up. And for some people, don't get me wrong, it's probably true. If you're in a small company and you don't have the money or the funds or resources for a huge security team, odds are hosting and Google or Amazon or wherever is better for you. Because the reality is that they do have, believe it or not, they actually do have people who are responsible for security in those systems. Um, but like Amazon says, it's a shared responsibility model, right? They're only responsible for their shit and not for what you put up in the cloud. So if you can't secure your servers, it doesn't matter if they're in the cloud or if they're in your, your, your site. And security's still gonna suck and, you know, nothing's gonna change that. Uh, the other side to it is, what does your cloud actually look like? Um, you know, does it look like a nice clean data center that's, you know, managed, secured, and locked down? Or does it look like some guy who's got Motherboard sitting on top of computer cases sitting in his bedroom closet, you know? Um, yeah, this is, this is where Hillary's email went. Um, you know, it's, it's exactly like this. You know, it's, um, it's one of those things where it, it, a lot gets lost because we, we've mystified and changed stuff and we've renamed things, right? I mean, we've had, ho like, like I said earlier, with IBM and DEC having time sharing services, we've had hosted services since the beginning of the internet, right? Um, so it's always been something that's available. It's just now we've given a new name and we've tried to sell it 
as, as something new and different. But it's really the same old thing with the same old problems. Um, but by renaming it, um, here's a great example. So look at Blackwater. Huge scandal, all their issues. What do they wind up doing? They rename themselves, and everybody forgets what the hell they did. It's, it's the same, you know, co corporations do this all the time with themselves. So then somebody realized, well, why don't we just rename our products and rename our services and the things that people used to hate because they didn't control them, they'll now love because they don't control them. So a lot of it is all about how well you can sell yourself. The internet everywhere. Um, and, and like I say, wasn't the internet always full of things? Um, I hate the word things. I think that's the part about the internet of things that drives me battier than anything. Um, you know, not so much that everything has an internet connection, <laughs> so much as the fact that we've used this term that is so generic, it doesn't really describe what the hell we're talking about. Um, we're, we're basically talking about a bunch of really crappy devices built by companies that have no business building anything that's a computer and then putting it into something that has no business having a computer and then selling it to people as if something that they need. You know, whether it's your internet connected refrigerator or toaster or oven. And when I heard there was an internet connected oven, I was just like, can we please burn down a house with it? Um, it's, you know, the internet connected thermostat. Um, listen, I love technology and convenience, but the second I first heard about Nest, I was like, that is the dumbest damn idea I've ever heard. Um, so the reality is there's little or no concern for security with this, right? I mean, these companies, their, their whole intent and their whole vision is well, we're providing convenience to people and making stuff easier. Um, and I've always made this argument that there's this, that convenience and security are usually two mutually exclusive things that cannot coexist at the same time. Um, the trick is to find the point where convenience and security are both at acceptable levels. Um, uh, the sad thing is with the Internet of Things, there is no concern whatsoever for security more times than not. So, yeah, I'm going to build my own Internet with blackjack and hookers. And blow. Hookers and blow. Um, I mean, that's exactly what we want. And like I've said, like I've been saying, what, what the hell are these things? Why do we need them? Why are they on our networks? And those are the questions that when anybody mentions the Internet of Things, you should be asking. And when somebody comes to your office and tries to sell you a product that says they're going to help you secure the Internet of Things, you should be asking yourself, do we even have an Internet of Things in our office? And then if you do, you should go find them and unplug them. For the love of God, those things have no business on a corporate network ever. In your home network, great. You want to screw up your own stuff, awesome. Do it. I don't care. But in a corporate network, you have no business with an Internet-connected fridge. You have no business with, you know, anything being internet connected that is not important to the execution of the job function of the company that you work for. Now I'm going to get some crap for the next one. Um, and I don't think any of the people who do this are in the room. So great. Call social engineering what it is, God damn it. You're a paid con man. Um, I hate the damn term. You're not an engineer. You don't engineer shit. And I'm sorry, I'm going to rant for a second. I have an engineering degree, so people who hate bachelor's degrees can yell at me now, too. You're not, you don't engineer anything. Um, I think I came up with this definition, actually. I don't think I looked this one up. Um, but I think it's pretty accurate, right? You're basically taking advantage of the inherent trust that most people in the world have for somebody else. You can go read psychology paper after psychology paper after psychology paper, and you will see People are always going to want to trust the next person. And what's worse is, when you put yourself in situations where you show them you have some commonality, they're going to trust you even more. Um, I can't remember the exact study, but it was essentially along the lines of like, well, if I went, they went and they said, told this group of people, hey, would you do X, Y, and Z for us, or something along those lines, and you know, they gauged how often they got the response. And then they went back to them and they came in and they said, they created some commonality, like, oh, we went to the same college, or we went, you know, we came from the same town, and they've created this bond or this connection, and all that has done is strengthen this. Now they're like, hey, this person is similar to me, and and so now they've created this this bond that you don't want. You, now you definitely don't want to distrust them because you're like, well, I know the people who are from that school or from that town or wherever, 
and I'm, I trust them because I want people to trust me, and that's where I'm from, and that's what I do. And so because of that, you know, it's, it's one of those things that um, it drives me a little nuts. Yeah. I'll try not to rail too much, I swear. Um, it's probably too late. Um, the other thing about social engineering that drives me a little nuts is all these services that basically offer, um, basically offer to, well, we're going to come in and socially engineer your office and figure out what we can do and this and that. And from a physical perspective, I think it's good because your your physical security guards are really your first and sometimes only line of defense about getting into a building, access, and those sorts of things. But when it comes to computers, I don't like it as much, and here's why. People are always going to click on stuff. I do not care how much you do, you run set against the office. I don't care how much you run um, SE exercises. The reality is people are always going to click on something. It's just a matter of how much effort are people going to put in to get you to click that. Um, there's this great quote, I remember one from when I was in college, basically said um, by Rich Cook from the registry, the wizardry compiled, which said, programming today is a race between software engineers striving to build bigger and better idiot-proof programs and the universe trying to produce bigger and better idiots. So far, the universe is winning. I'm here to tell you, with cybersecurity, it is the exact same way. We can do everything you want. You can build better training programs. You can build better software. You can build better um, better protection mechanisms. But the reality is there's always going to be somebody dumber sitting on the other side of the keyboard. I don't want to rail on the users because it's not just the users. But mitigate the actions, not the people. You're never going to mitigate the people, right? Short of firing and rehiring and finding people, you're, but you're never going to fix the problem. If you want to fix the problem, you need to make it so that when they click on shit, it doesn't load something, right? Oh, he clicked on shit. Oh, this program tried to run. Guess what? Our whitelisting stopped it, or something stopped it. For love of God, just make it harder. The reality is for most people in this room, the, the people that are going to be targeting you aren't going to be those five Chinese PLA people I showed you pictures of about 10 slides ago. It's going to be that script kitty who has nothing better to do, who found set and found a way to you know, run a social engineering attack. That's that's what most of your target's going to be. The reality is that it's, you're going to get three, in my mind there are three main levels of attackers. You're going to get your script kitties, you're going to get your nation states, and you're going to get your criminals. You're going to get the ones who want to steal your personal information so they can sell it on the black, you know, on the dark net. And, thank you. So they can sell it. So they can sell it online. The cyber black yes, the cyber black market. Ooh. So you're going to get people. Those are your three levels. And let me tell you, the first two, two of those, they just want quick and easy. They want to find the lowest hanging fruit, attack those networks, get that information, so they can turn around. And the script kitty can go into 4chan and be like, "Look at what I did," or the. The, the guy who's still in the PII can go in and he can go and turn around and sell it for, you know, a couple thousand dollars. They don't want to spend days or weeks or months trying to get extra information. They just want the quick score so they can get their money or get their notoriety. The ones you need to worry about are the more organized ones who actually have an intent. Because those are the ones who are going to spend the time to find a way to get your people to click shit. They're going to find a way to do stuff. And ultimately, you know what SE training does? It, it helps, it, it, it teaches your people to avoid the Nigerian prince, but that's really it. Um, it it's never, it, ultimately, if you're going to get to a point where somebody's going to be able to build enough trust with at least one user to get them to click on something. If you want to worry about SE training, worry about it at your administrator levels, because those are the people that when they get popped, they now have creds for the entire network. If you're smart and your users don't have creds beyond their local systems and no real permissions outside of that, then they can pop them all day. You're going to get reports from your logs when they get popped, and you're going to go and say, okay, we're disconnecting you from the network, and we're going to re-explain to you why you, what you did was bad, and we're going to move on. So why have buzzwords become the APT of our industry? Why can't we get rid of them? 
it's it's really the same reason that this exists, and I'm not going to get into a flame war about booth babes. But the reality is they both exist because the decision maker is usually a bunch of old white guys who don't know crap about anything except making lots of money. Um, so the other one, and I'll probably get crap from this, and I want to apologize first to any salesmen who are in the room. Um, this doesn't apply to all of them. Um, for nobody who has a musical background, it, it's, you may not enjoy that as much as I do. Thank you. Um, I was actually surprised nobody had created this as a meme for many a great things about having trouble. Um, I actually had to go create it. Um, sale, the reality is salesmen make their money on commission, right? Their job is to sell a product so that they can get more money at the end of the day. Now, some people, I, and I have met them. I have a good friend who is a sales engineer, and he, if his product can't do something, he will say it can't do it. And he doesn't try to sell people on stuff that, that, that the product that he supports um, can't do. And he sells something that he believes in, and I think that's an important thing from his perspective, right? Um, but there are a lot of salespeople who, at the end of the day, want to be the highest earner in their office, who want to make the most money. They're basically used car salesmen who have gone from selling used cars to selling, you know, cyber, yes. Because cyber makes more money and makes it faster, right? I can go sell a $15,000 beater or I can go sell, you know, make a $10 million sale to the U.S. government or to some large corporation and, you know, make more money than I would selling, you know, a dozen cars. Um, you know, it's one of those things where they'll do things. They'll make outrageous claims. They'll try to convince you you have a problem that you may not have. Um, I, I will say this too. It, it's not always their fault. Uh, a lot of these large companies have training programs where when you become a salesman, you go off to salesman boot camp and they teach you everything they want you to know about selling this product. And those things, some of the things they tell you that, that stuff can do, it may not be lies, but it's it's probably borderline, right? And ultimately what happens is when you get that kind of slick salesman, that con man in your office, this is what happens. The executives just say, shut up and take my money. Um, and it, the reality is money makes the world go around, right? Companies want to make a lot of money. Uh, other companies want to save lots of money. So the people selling you the products, they want to make all their money. You want to keep all your money, so you don't want to spend as much money, so you'll buy crappier products. Um, and, and the reality is, snappy languages, uh, you know, buzzwords and booth babes are a heck of a lot cheaper than spending time to innovate. I mean, that's the reality of the situation. I It's going to cost me tens of thousands, if not millions of dollars, to pay a couple engineers to make something new and incredible and continue to gr drive and grow a product. Um, but if I have, if I can sell people on something, I can make a lot more money. And it's cheaper for me to pay a couple of girls to stand around my booth half naked for a weekend than it is for me to actually pay a couple engineers to do some real work. So I know this slide looks a little cut short, and actually I think I repeat stuff on the next one, so I'm just going to go over here. The reality is education's a lot of it too. Um, you might have times where your management isn't as secure technically. Uh, they ha may have outdated, out-of-touch information, right? Um, it's this old, this old problem, right? And a lot of us in this room probably face it, which is, you know, somebody comes to you and asks you, do you want to be a manager? And if you're technical and hands-on, our first inclination is usually to say, hell no. But the reality is, at some point somebody had to do that job, and, you know, maybe they have less time to be technical. And I've had plenty of managers who are technical. Um, the important thing is to have, so long as management understands their shortcomings, it works out fine. Um, it's when they don't, and they don't rely on their people, that stuff, you know, becomes a problem. <clears throat> So, we're going to talk a little about destroying the buzz. Um, 
I had a boss who always used to tell me, bring me solutions, not problems. Um, and so I, I would feel pretty crappy if I stood up here for 45 minutes and just ranted and raved like I have for the first 30 of this and didn't come up with at least some idea of how we fix this, right? Um, so there's a couple things I've decided that, you know, we need to not do. Um, we're all guilty of it. I'm guilty of it. I've basically spent half of my time standing up here doing it. Um, people will constantly use the phrase echo chamber. Um, we, we've kind of created that at these conferences as well. Um, so things you should not do. Um, the needless bitching and needless bitching everywhere, right? Um, when we're here and we're in like-minded company, it's fine. But when we go back to work and you're dealing with management and you're dealing with non-technical persons, this doesn't do anything. Ultimately, it makes us look bad. Um, it makes our opinions look worthless. Um, it does a lot to hurt our own image and doesn't do much to help our cause. Kind of similar in vain to that is, is, is acting disgusted and acting with disdain. Um, you know, if I've set up here, I've bitched about a couple companies and I've maybe hinted very heavily at the companies I'm talking about and even mentioned a few by name. Um, but the reality is doing that in your work environment, again, it creates a much of the same atmosphere, right? If, if you're the person who's constantly bitching, who's constantly complaining, who seems to do nothing but attack and doesn't come in and offer support and offer solutions, you're just going to get dismissed. Maybe not at first, but over time it'll happen. Um, I feared it happening to me uh, at my last job, uh, not in relation to technical work, but in relation to other matters. And it got to the point where I felt, I don't feel like anything's changing when I complain. Maybe I'm just being ignored at this point. And um, so if, if you start creating so much noise that they can't, that nobody can identify when you have a legitimate complaint versus when, you know, in my case, when it's just Joey being Joey and he won't shut up. If, if they can't differentiate that and you don't create a, an environment where that can be differentiated, then you're going to, you're going to get to a point where nobody's going to take you seriously and nobody's going to listen to what you have to say. The other one is sneak attacking. Um, I had to get cats in. Um, it's talking about other people in your office, talking about, you know, oh, that, that, that stupid management of ours, all those idiots making the decisions who are pissing away money on, you know, vacations to Hawaii or some Caribbean island or wherever the hell, and bitching about that sort of stuff about your company, uh, bitching about the, the, the products that you're looking at, or about the, you know, oh, I had a horrible interaction with their support guy one time, or their sales guy did this, or their sales guy did that. If, if you're going to do stuff like that, it's important to have information to back up what you're saying. Just ad hominem attacks is not going to help you. You need to be able to provide actual information as to why you think something is a bad idea, or why a product isn't good, or why you don't need to spend the money that you need to spend. And so it's very important that the more, the less we sound like we do when we're here and we bitch, 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 and cyber, ugh, cloud, ugh, you know, those audible groans. That's great here. It's fine. Get it out. Come to as many cons as you can and do that. If you have to go to three or four years so that you don't do it at your office, great. The second you start doing it at your office all the time, you start to lose any sort of credibility, and we just look like a bunch of, like, you know, you know, complaining idiots who just want to, you know, yell about everybody else in the office, but we're not the problem, right? It's that thing where if, if you start to think everybody's crazy except you, maybe you're the one who's crazy, it's, that's what they're going to start thinking is, well, you guys must be nuts because you keep thinking, telling us we're all the crazy people. So what should you do? The first thing is to educate, right? Help enable your management to make smarter decisions. You know, make sure that they that that they know what you need. Make sure that they know what's going on. If you see some some news article or something mentioned on Twitter that impacts your business, make sure your management sees it. Make sure your management not saying send them everything about every new zero day that just got thrown out there. But if you see some big life-changing thing that might change the way your company does business or change the way that you're, you're doing stuff, work with your management and make sure they understand the issues 
and then work with them to help solve whatever those issues are. Um, nurture the relationships with your managers, um, with your technical resources, with other companies. Um, you know, you, you need to have good relationships with those. If you have technical resources in the company, if you know people who are engineers or developers or testing at you know a company that you guys are going to be acquiring a product, keep those relationships fresh, right? Um, you know, uh, it's it's one of those things where if you have people that you can reach out to, then you can make you can help influence what it is you're working on, right? Um, and then help others find out what's behind the buzzword, right? If your manager keeps saying you have a cyber problem, don't scoff, don't laugh, don't go drink. That's fine here. But find out what the heck they're actually talking about. Do we have a system security problem? Is there something on our workstations that's bad? Do we have a network security problem? Do we need to put more IDSs in? Do we need to have better log management? What is the actual problem? Because just yelling cyber it's about as bad as you know going into a room and yelling fire. It causes about as much panic. So define those real issues and help them define those real issues. If they say, well, somebody came in and tried to tell me, you know, we need to get this product because blah, 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 blah. Take those points that that company tried to come in and say that you needed and then work backwards with them. Try to find out, well, is this actually a problem for us? You know? And then if it is, if you need to do things, make sure that you work with them. And that kind of takes us to the next one, which is engaging in the process. Uh, and this goes to any managers in the room, too. Um, make sure you have your most technical people or at least one technical person with you if there's an issue that you're afraid you don't know all the information for to engage in the acquisition of new technologies. The reality is you need people who can, who can ask the tough questions and then they can sense, and people who will have enough sense to know, is the salesman or is their sales engineer just bullshitting me about what it is their product can do, right? Your best technical people are going to be able to sniff out that BS. They're going to know when somebody's just selling you, you know, a bunch of vapor. Avoid the condescension and derision, right? I'm going to keep repeating this. When you're in these situations, remain professional. Do not get confrontational. It does nobody any good. Again, this is the place for us to do that. If we want to bitch and complain, go get a couple beers with your friends downstairs at the bar and talk about how much you hate product X because those bastards didn't do something properly or they tried to sell you some BS and, you, and your network still got owned. And like I said earlier, avoid the ad hominem attacks. Look for facts and past performances. If the company uses a bunch of statistics to reference why their product is great, ask for as much detail as they'll give you. You know, ultimately you'll find if you go, if you ask the salesman for more information, they're going to want to share as much as they feel they legally can sometimes because the reality is if they think it'll make them the sale, they'll give you whatever it is you want um, within reason. Um, I've yet to be able to get anybody to give me a, like a Tesla or anything like that. Participate in the engineering process is the other one. Um, when these new products are acquired, if you can't be involved in the acquisition phase and and in their actual decision-making process, try to get involved in the engineering process, okay? Be sure to have these discussions about the deployments, how the system design is going to be set up, what's being done to make sure that this new device is being secured, right? I can go drop, you know, half a million dollars, a couple million dollars to put IDSs all throughout my ginormous network. But if I drop them in place and your engineering guys don't realize, well, we should change the default password from, you know, admin password, it doesn't do anything because now when the hackers do get into your network, they're just going to turn off your IDS. Um, and th that's the important thing, right? Helping to guide the process, ensuring that we are getting that security in from the time it's being deployed until the time that it's at age and that it's been running for years. Um, encourage active testing and assessments of products. Um, you know, as you put something new in, if you have a red team or a blue team or any team, let them, let them bang on it, let them whack on it, let them see if they can get it to do something it's not supposed to do. If, if you're not doing that for everything you put on your network, um, I know it can be huge, a huge problem, but if you just dropped 100 IDS you know, sensors in your network, 
and you aren't going back and trying to figure out are these things secured, you've got a bigger problem. And last one is work with vendors to resolve the issues that you find. The good vendors will work with you. If you find something that is a security issue, that's a performance issue, that's a management issue, good vendors will work with you. If any vendor says they don't want to work with you, or worse yet, they threaten anyone who comes out with an exploit, whether it's somebody from your company, another company, or a public researcher, don't do business with that company. They have no business in this field if they can't accept the criticisms of their own products and they can't accept that they need to fix problems. Because if you're selling security products and they are insecure, if we can't trust those products, how the hell can we trust anything that's coming out of them? So the last one. This is what you can do, not a should do, because it's not for everybody in this room. It's manage and lead. So I know management is a scary word for a lot of people. I've done it twice, and it is very scary. But if you don't have people who are technical in these management roles, how are we going to get them there if some of us don't actually go into management, right? Become a manager. If you're so inclined, become a VP. Become a C Blanco, right? Whether it's a CTO, a CISO, a CSO, whatever is appropriate fit for your skill set for what you do. Get involved and, and, and take on those roles and learn more. If that's something that even remotely is interesting to you. If, if you aren't sure, go talk to your manager. Go talk and, and find out. You know, I'd want to do more manager type things. I want to be involved in these other situations. Most managers aren't going to think, oh great, this guy's gunning for my job. No, they're going to think it's growth, okay? And in, in the end, the people who manage you and the people who lead you want to see you grow. And if you're happy growing in a technical role for the rest of your life, a good manager and a good leader should both be fine with that. If you want to go into another management role, then they should also be willing to help enable that path forward. Um, and it's the last point I make there, right, is manipulating this process from the bottom is very hard. Right? It's why we come here at every con and we say the same thing over and over and over again. The reality is that it's hard for me to have a certain level of influence when there's a guy making two or three times my salary up here who is worrying more about a bottom line than anything else. And sometimes those people have a vision that you may not have. So it's not, it's not even right to assume that they're always wrong. The other side is the other thing to it besides managing is leading. And, you know, um, you don't have to manage people to be a leader. If you want to take on a leadership role in your organization, you want to help people in your office get better, you want to help people grow and learn more, and even if that's your own managers, go ahead and do it. Most people aren't going to stop you. If you want to try to, to improve a process, you know, it, I'm not... You may have to take some of your own time. I'm going to be dead serious. But you know what? If it's important enough to you, you should do it. I'm not going to lie. Um, I, I would do it in my current job now. And that's not just me BSing uh, in case my boss hears. That, it's the truth, right? If you like the company you work for, if you like the job you're doing, and you like the people you work with, then you should strive in some way, shape, or form to lead those people, to help them grow, to help them get better, and then to help, and in many ways, help yourself. So it's very important to remember that. So I'm near the end. The rant is almost done. So to summarize, be part of the process. Don't act violently against it. Don't be passive aggressive. You have a better chance from changing above. I'm just going to admit that. And, you know, if you're not, if you don't want to be management and your manager leaves, goes on to something else, retires, and that position becomes available. If you don't want that job, and your friends don't want that job, who, or your coworkers don't want that job, if there are people you know who are, there's lots of people here that you can be networking with this weekend, that you can become friends with, that you can um, have this connection with, and you know that they're good, solid, strong, technical people, and they have this desire, then talk to them and see if they'll come and do that. Because the best thing that we can do is get more technical people higher up in the chain, and it will help with a lot of the problems. Um, I didn't really get too much into the story before, but it, um, you know, when I had the old white man's picture up, 
my brother works for a company that is very much based in that mentality. It is a bunch of old guys who, who don't have the technical know-how. A couple years ago, they heard about iPads, and they were excited, and they all wanted them. They have very little technical understanding. This is a company that has very minimal web presence because it's still a fad. It's just a fad. It's going to go away. Um, and so for them, it, it's one of those things where they don't have that those people at the top, and even the people who are in those technical management roles are relatively clueless. And so that's a tough thing for people to fight against, especially from below. So I'm running out of time. I'll take a few questions if anybody has them. I have one slide I really have to get to, and I wish like hell Dave Kennedy was in here for it. Does anybody have a radio? Can I please get Dave Kennedy? <laughs> Are there any questions? Nobody? Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll put up my contact info for anybody who wants it. Um, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Um, so, I've got three slides left. If I can get Dave. Please, Dave, come. And unfortunately, I mean, that is that is the reality. A lot of times the people that you're dealing with, that is what they know, that is what they can do. Um, and that, that's what you're going to have to deal with. I mean, it's sad. It's sometimes the reality. is Sometimes you have to somewhat become what it is you're trying to avoid. Um, and and so it's important to, you know, it, it's balancing that, right, is, um, is trying to... Um, is trying to balance that that desire to to change the mentality, but at the same time having to feed into it to some extent because you have those people who that's all they understand and that's all they know. Um, so I am totally running out of time, and I'm not getting a Dave. This is going to make me sad, but... Yeah, Dave, if you're watching, this is for you. So... Dave Kennedy, um, so I've been thinking about this for a while. It seemed to me that he was an inspiration for an important recent movie uh, character. And so, you know, was it any of the guys from Hackers? No, no, it wasn't that. He's not good enough to, you know, for it to be Black Hat. I, I love you, Dave. You're, I love you, I swear. No, this really and truly is Dave Kennedy. Uh... How come nobody has done this before? I do not know. But let's admit it. Like, Dave's a hugger. Olaf's a hugger. Olaf's got three little twigs sticking out for hair. I mean, Dave doesn't have as much as he used to. It's, and, and when this movie was being made, and, and you know, Dave, Dave's done a great job losing a lot of weight. I commend him for that. But when this movie was made a couple years ago, Dave was still a little hefty. Olaf's a little round on the bottom. I'm just saying, Dave Kennedy, you are Olaf. So thank you for everybody for coming out. I hope you found it at least somewhat entertaining. Well, I was trying to avoid that one. Okay.